Well, good morning, everybody. We just tried something a little different there with the video. Uh, I don't know if everybody knew that service had started, but hey, welcome and good morning. This is our first service for uh, 2020, and uh, I don't want to just wish you a happy new year. I want to wish you a happy new decade, if you can imagine. We really sense that uh, God is going to be moving. If you notice on Facebook, I put up on uh, an advertisement to say that uh, there was a, a citywide prayer event. And I went to that on Friday. I didn't know what that was going to be like because you never know what a prayer event's going to be like. I'll tell you, the, the presence of God was so powerful. It was so beautiful. And there was a lot, there's just incredible unity. There's people from uh, Grand Bay uh, Wesleyan. Uh, there's people from KV Baptist. There was people from Lancaster Baptist. There was people from Hillcrest Baptist. There was people from an Anglican background. It was just the body of Christ coming together to worship God. And it was so powerful. And two words came out very clearly. And it really resonated with what we've been hearing here in, amongst the leadership at our church. And the first is that God is cleaning house. God is cleaning house. In the last few years since I've been here, the renovations that we've been doing, both physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, uh, it's all part of what God's been doing. The second thing that we've been hearing uh, is that freedom. And that's been a word that God's been sharing with us for the last while, is that he's bringing more freedom. And so uh, as we get ready for communion this morning, uh, I'm going I'm to spend a bit of time as, as, we, as we take this first communion of the decade, uh, the first communion of this year, we're expecting great things. The last word that kind of came out of, of, the, of the prayer event was this. It said, like never before. Like never before. And I'll tell you, we've seen God move. I've seen God move very powerfully and touch people's lives in wonderful ways. But they said, like never before. And I'll tell you, one of the most important things is humility. Humility that, that God can pour through his, his humble servants. God will use the weak things of the world. He'll use the unwise things. He'll use it to confound the strong. And you know what? I look at myself and I think, I'm a prime candidate to be used by God. <laughs> And if I say you are too, I don't mean that in any kind of insulting way, but hey, you know what? The more humble we are, the more uh, available we are, the more God will be willing to do through us. What we have felt as leadership of pastors in St. John is that God is not waiting for us. He's decided to move anyways. He's going to move in spite of us, but the more ready we are, the more of a blessing we'll be able to be to our city, to our community. So we have been getting ready. I felt for a long time that it's been an acceleration. The way that Hillcrest has moved and changed in the last five or six years, for you who've grown up in Hillcrest, you know it's been a tremendous amount of change. And there's still more to come. Thank you, um, Thank you for, for paying the uh, emotional price, the spiritual price, to help us move forward, to give us permission to be ready for a move of God. I, I really believe and we really sense uh, the pastors in the area all agree something is very different about this year. And I'm not just saying that because, you know, you, you try and, ooh, emotionally rise things up. No, we don't need to do that. God has decided to do something. So we just want to continue to be ready and get ready. So we decided we wanted to start this morning's service with communion. We want to start by honoring God and reminding ourselves of the covenant that we have in Jesus Christ through his blood. It's a covenant relationship. You know, even back to Abraham, God said a covenant with himself he didn't even make it with Abraham. He made it with himself. I will do whatever it takes to rescue my people. And we just finished celebrating. Do we ever stop? I don't know. But we just finished celebrating Christmas and, 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 the, and the birth of Jesus Christ. The promise that people have been waiting for for 4,000 years. I think of Eve wondering if one of her children was going to bring salvation but she passed before the flood and she didn't get to see. But the hope, the hope we've seen fulfilled and we have Jesus Christ in our lives now. And so I just want to take a moment to, to humble ourselves and just to remind ourselves of the covenant promises that we have in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to invite you to the table of the Lord. 
This table is decorated, so we're not going to use it like we normally do. We're going to do communion like we did last time. This table doesn't belong to Hillcrest Baptist Church. It doesn't belong to the Baptist Convention or the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. It belongs to Jesus Christ. This is his table. And it has been made ready today for anybody here who loves God. And for those who want to love God more, we have a spot for you. So come, you who have much faith and you who feel like you have little. You who've been here often and you have not been here for a long time. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed and I who have failed, come. Not because it's I who invite you, but it's because the Lord Jesus Christ himself wants to share his table with you. If you want to meet with him this morning, then you're in luck. Because he wants to meet with you. It's not just a new year. Again, it's a new decade. And we're praying that when people look back, we look at in the 1920s when we say it was the roaring 20s. Well, we're praying, and I'm praying in my heart, that the 2020s, people will say it's the roaring 20s, but because the line of Judah is roaring so powerfully in our lives and in our hearts. So the words that came, first one was freedom. Now look at John chapter 10, 10. It says, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Actually, in the ESV, it says, have it abundantly. In the NIV, it says, to have it to the full. In the Berean Study Bible, it says, and to have life in all its fullness. In the New King James, it says, I love this one, more abundantly. I can, like, that's like really bad English, but it's fantastic. In the Andrew Morris edition, it says, you may have life more wildly. So what does that look like for you? Where do you need freedom in order to be ready for this move of God? To have your house cleaned, to, to have that freedom. What does that look like for you? Where are you bound up? Where are your struggles? Where has the thief been trying to strike in your life? Jesus did not come and die on the cross just to have Satan steal everything from you. You know, I don't give my children lunch money hoping for a bully to steal their money <laughs> and leave my child hungry. I gave it to my kids. I want my children to be blessed. So this morning, do you need healing in your mind, in your body, in your finances, in your emotions? Well, it's through Christ's work on the cross and his body being lifted up for you that we have access to freedom today. He was nailed to the cross that you could be free. And as the deacons come up and they pass the, the cup or the bread and the plate is passed around, I want you to ask the Lord to show you where you are not free. And then when it comes time to eat the bread, I want you to envision God setting you free by the act, the physical act of faith, that you're agreeing with him to set you free. So I'm going to take a piece of this bread and then I'll pray for the bread. Heavenly Father, we need freedom. We need you to cleanse our hearts. We need you to make us clean vessels. And Lord, in our covenant relationship with you, we remind ourselves that you were lifted on the cross. Your body was lifted on the cross for us that we could walk into freedom. Lord, as this plate is passed around, show us where we're not free. And then help us to surrender that to you. Lord, because if you show us where we're not free, you're telling us that you want us to be free in that area. And you are going to meet us here today. You are going to bring us freedom. And we're going to take a step of faith and agree with you that what you show us, Lord, you intend to free us. So Lord, we thank you for this. And we pray this in your wonderful holy name. Amen. Yeah. As the Lord showed you somewhere where you're not free, then I want you to take this bread as an act of faith, knowing that Jesus Christ has promised to set you free. The Lord Jesus, in the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
like never before. That was the other word that came out of the prayer meeting. How is God speaking to you personally lately? Where is he helping you to grow? Where do you feel that God is going to move in your life like never before? Do you know that God desires to do that, to actually move in your life like never before? Is it to grow in maturity, to, into a deeper revelation of him, maybe deeper confidence, trust, faith, a new level of surrender, hope, a deeper desire to win the loss, to be even more wildly loving? But you know what I've discovered on this journey? You don't need to force a change. You don't need to force the change. As the cup is passed around, I'd like you to ask God for him to show you where it is that he desires to work in your life. That he could work in your life like never before. Where does he want to work in your life? Where is his strength and power moving already? And I want you to agree with him to allow him to move in that way. I'll ask the deacons to come forward as I pray for the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've not just desired to, to save us from hell and then leave us to our own, um, our own mechanics or our own uh, dreams, but Lord, you've, you've, you've not just left us to wander through life, Lord, you have a destiny and a plan for us, Lord. You've prepared good works for us, Lord. You've prepared people for us to love Lord, we think of what Kevin Vincent said about families out west wishing there would be people that would do anything to reach their kids. Lord, help us to become the church that loves so wildly, Lord, that, that has an impact on people, that, Lord, that we can become available to be used by you like never before. Lord, I pray that as this plate is passed around, you would share with us where it is that you want to work in us like never before so we can take a step of faith and agree with what you're doing. And Lord, help us to not feel guilt or shame or, or striving, but Lord, help us to surrender to your will for our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. Have you identified where God wants to work in your life like never before? When you take the cup this morning, take it as a step of faith that you are agreeing with the Lord to move in your life like never before. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Amen. I believe we've started this new decade in the right spirit of humility and the right spirit of surrendering ourselves to the Lord. We have a short video to show you as the worship team takes their place.
praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Our God is powerful. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. That was awesome singing out there. The Lord is welcoming the praise of his people. Amen. We're going to ask the ushers to come forward. I see them gathering back there. It is a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. To come together as brothers and sisters and worship our Lord. Thank you, Lord. We just thank you for this day. We thank you for your power. Our God is awesome. You are awesome. There's no one like you, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for, for that. And we just praise you for your provision for us, Lord. We pray now that we can give back to you and help the furthering of your kingdom and the work, Lord. We just pray that you will bless these offerings today. In your precious and holy name, amen. This time we're going to ask the children to come forward. Rahama has a children's story for us. And, uh, yeah. Good morning. So, um, can anyone, does anyone know what the word lying means? Not you. <laughs> can any children tell me what the word lying means? Or do you know the word lying? <laughs> no. And you may be seated. Most of you already are. <laughs> We're beginning a new series, and we're going to be talking about the kingdom of God. And this song, uh, Build Your Kingdom Here, where are we thinking that we want God to build your kingdom? Where, where do you want God to build his kingdom? Anybody? In your heart. That's a great place. That's right. One of the things that I've had people share with me the last little while, too, is, and, and this idea, uh, there's something we're going to be exploring called fresh expressions. You know, church outside the church. And this is something God's been laying on our hearts for the last while. And it was really fun at the, at the prayer meeting. Someone was sharing with me like how they had this, this vision that you know, people were, were having church in laundromats. And they're having churches in Tim Hortons. That they just couldn't wait for Sunday to have church. They'd be knocking on people's doors hungry for the word of God. And I was thinking, that sounds a lot like the fresh expressions that God's been laying on our hearts as a church. I'm not saying that's the only way God can do it because, you know, God, he doesn't play by our rules. I, I, he always likes to remind me of that. As soon as I think I've got him figured out, he's like, oh, by the way, yeah, no, I'm God. <laughs> I can do it however I want. And our God is fantastic. So to begin our series on, on the kingdoms, I, I think it's important we kind of bring to light, no pun intended, mostly, <laughs> that there's two kingdoms. There's two kingdoms. Now, can you imagine... Is Holly here or is she downstairs? She's downstairs. Can you imagine if I told Holly, Holly, it's very important that you know this. I, I've been keeping this a secret for you for the last 18, 19 years. Actually, I must well tell Emily. Emily, it's, it's a secret I've been keeping for the last 19 years. The truth is, Emily, I'm a king. I'm actually a prince of another country. And my mom's really mad at me, and, and I actually came here to, uh, to find true love without someone actually knowing that I'm a prince. And so it's time for me to go back to my nation, and I'm going to bring you and Caleb and even Zach and Holly back with me. And, and Oh, wait, no, that's a Hallmark movie. Uh, <laughs> right. right. The truth is, uh, you know, we belong to a kingdom. And every kingdom has a... A ruler, and they have a king, they have a queen, they have, they have people that are in charge. And you know what? The Lord has identified himself as the king of kings. 
and the Lord of lords. Who are those kings and who are those lords? That's us. We are children of the king. That makes us royalty. It's a pretty amazing thing to think about. There's, there's those two kingdoms though, right? Get to my notes. Where am I there? Right. So Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21 says this. Once I'm being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, you know, they were thinking a very physical, military, usurp, you know, rebel against the Romans because that was what it had been for the last several hundred years. He replied, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. It's not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is. Well, there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's here right now. When Jesus came, after 4,000 years of waiting for that promise from Genesis, it was a promise fulfilled. It was an invasion of the kingdom of light into the kingdom of darkness like it had never been invaded before. You see, there's a battle going on between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. There's a Tension. Maybe you know the Lord's Prayer. There's this, this little part that says, you know, thy will be done. No, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is, is in heaven. So if we have to pray that his kingdom would come, it means it's not here in its full revelation. And we know that in Revelation 21, that's when his kingdom comes in a whole new dynamic. And it will be awesome and amazing, but we're not there yet. So until that time comes, we pray the uh, Lord's Prayer, the prayer that he taught his disciples, and it's, um, it's invoking the kingdom of God to come alive now in our midst, in my life, in my family, in my situations, in my ministries. I do want to say a special greeting to Esther. Um, she's been a beautiful missionary uh, to India in the last while, and, and she's going to be moving away. Uh, we just thank you for your faithfulness, Esther, in, in serving different communities and being a missionary and, and being a light, uh, a kingdom light in the world. And we don't know exactly what God has planned for you, but we know it's going to be awesome. So we just want to encourage you, and we'll probably spend a little time praying for you later, if that's all right, before you. Because when are you heading out? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay, well, we're going to have a little time of prayer before we leave church today, and we're just going to make sure that you have a full family of God blessing on you before you head out. So thank you for choosing to be here with us this morning, and we'll just trust that God will richly bless you. So, so Sterling, if I forget you, make sure we pray for Esther. Thank you. <laughs> so our Father in heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Which means that in earth, there's tension. There's tension. We know in the book of Daniel that God had answered Daniel's prayer, but it was seven days of fighting in the spiritual realm before Daniel could get his answer. And, and the angel Gabriel was like, listen, man, I left right away to give you your answer, but the, the, the spiritual power uh, of the air at the time was getting my way, and Michael had to come and lay down the law so I could come down here and give you your answer. So there's tension. There is a kingdom of darkness. There's a kingdom of light. And we need to be aware of that. I mean, one of the things I don't go looking for, when I was a teenager, I used to be a lot more full of pride and, you know, I think like, you know, I'm a mighty man of God. I like to meet a person who's possessed or, you know, uh, you know, where there's some dark demons going on, I'll cast them out in the name of Jesus and stuff. That's fine and dandy until you're actually in that situation. And there's, you just don't go looking for that stuff, right? If it finds you, fine. You have the authority of Christ. But you don't go looking for that stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's real. There is a real kingdom of darkness. It's not make-believe. It's not like Hollywood. I mean, I know some people don't like Harry Potter and stuff, but you know, the truth is, that's imagination. That is nowhere near the real thing. Don't get caught up in that distraction. Real kingdom of darkness is confusion. It's, it's painful. The consequences are terrible. But anyways, let's not have, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. There's tension. And, and we have several scriptures uh, that really speak out on this. There's some in Ezekiel, there's some in Isaiah. But I think Revelations gives us the more comprehensive view of what happened. Revelations chapter 12, verse 7 to 9 and verse 12. There was war in heaven. There can only be war if there was free will. And it was one of the wonderful gifts that God has given his creation. It's this terrible, wonderful gift of free will. So there was war in heaven. 
of all places. I mean, you got to be face to face with God. And yet, there was still war. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, but they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, starting with Adam and Eve. <laughs> he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. We skip to verse 12. It says, for this reason, rejoice, O heavens. Yay, heavens. And you dwell in them. Woe to the earth. Woe to the sea. Because the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Knowing he only has a short time. Only has a short time. For us, you know, the 6,000 year, if you believe in a short, not short, doesn't matter. If you believe in a, in a, in a new earth, uh, 6,000 years is not a very long time compared to eternity. If you believe in an old earth, millions of years, compared to eternity, that's still not very long. So have it whatever you want. Satan's down here for a short time and he's full of wrath and his first victims were Adam and Eve. He deceived them. He went right after them said, hey, you guys could be like God too. It's like, really? Just have to eat this fruit? Great. And they surrendered their authority to Satan. And there's war here on earth between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Doesn't take much to look around the world and say, there is something wrong in the world today, right? You don't need a preacher to tell you that. I was reading an article uh, written by Cal Thomas. He says, the one thing that hasn't changed in the past hundred years, and for that matter, since the first humans walked the earth, is human nature. One can change styles of clothing and hair, change modes of transportation, even change politicians, but human nature never changes. This isn't a, from a Christian magazine. This is just from a magazine. This is greed, lust, and the quest for power are embedded in each of us in every generation. The saying that the more things change, the more they remain the same has never seemed more accurate and providential. John 14, 30 says that at this time, Satan is the prince of this world. And this is what his kingdom's like. It says this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 to 8 and 9. And I'm kind of taking what Paul says in Colossians. He says, like, this is not how you want to live, but this is what the kingdom of darkness looks like. Paul says, put to death, therefore, what belongs to your earthly nature, what belongs to the kingdom of darkness, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Putting to death is an act. It's an action. It says, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And as Rahama said this morning, do not lie to each other. Now James tells us if you can control the tongue, man, you can, you can control anything. But that's what the kingdom of darkness looks like. Jesus said, it's not what goes in that defiles a man. It's what comes out. And it spills onto other people. You know, ever been slimed by someone else and just, blah. The kingdom of darkness doesn't sound very appealing. But we often return to it because it's familiar. You know, we get angry. And I put my Christian hat off and I put my human hat on, and look, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but we shouldn't take our Christian hat, we should let that Christian hat be on at all times, that kingdom of light should be active in us at all times. You know, it seems like we've suffered in the kingdom of darkness for so long that the kingdom of heaven just seems alien. It seems inhuman, it seems like, can we really actually, that's not how the world works, Andrew. Well, that's okay, because the world's not working anyways. So if what's working isn't working, no. If what's being tried to work is not working, let's try something new. I love that Christmas song that goes, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. You know, and it's like, and, and the song is like, is there any hope? Is there any hope? Is there any hope? But by the end of the, the carol, it's like, yes. Yes, there is. 
And we have to determine which kingdom are we going to live in? Which rules are we going to allow to apply to our lives? Which kingdom are we going to allow God to build in our life? Scripture shows us what the kingdom of heaven is like. In Colossians as well, Paul says this, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Our holiness isn't based on us. It's based on what he's done for us. Clothe yourselves. Again, it's an action. The other one said put to death. This one says clothe yourself. Clothe yourselves with compassion. In other words, you know when you get up this morning and you're looking at your clothes and you realize how, how rich you really are when you look, I have options for clothes. <laughs> when you look at your clothes and you say, I'm going to choose what to wear today. You intentionally wrap it around yourself because you're conveying a message, right? Some people dress all in black because they're upset. Some people dress all in white because I don't know why. They just might. <laughs> but we, we dress to, to send a message. When I dress up like this, I try and say, you know, I want to show honor to Christ. I want to show honor to um, the role I have as a, as a pastor, especially at communion. When I wear jeans and a, and a t-shirt when I preach, it says, I just, I'm human like you. I want you to know that I am this guy everywhere I go. Right? So there's different messages we want to convey at different times. When I do a wedding and I'm all dressed up in a suit and tie and the pin and everything, it's because I want the office of pastor to, to in its full regalia, without the funny hat. You know, it's, uh, we, we convey something. So we choose to put on compassion. We choose to put on kindness, one sock at a time. Humility, gentleness, and patience. We choose to live in this way in the kingdom of light. And we bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, Paul says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's a choice. And that is not always easy. And sometimes it's a daily thing. And over all these virtues, so you're fully dressed, what's your outer coat? You're going to go out into the messy weather? What's your gloves going to be and such? Over all those virtues... Clothe yourself in love. Clothe yourself in love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. It's like, it's like having a pajama day. You got your slippers on, your socks on, your flannel pants, and your, your cute little shirt, and then you put the robe on. And then we got a robe, and just like you put that on, you're like, oh, yeah. Right? And then coffee, and then, you know, anyways. It just, it binds them all together. I made the mistake the other day. I, I said, I declare a pajama day. <laughs> Ten minutes later, someone at my door. So I was like, ah, oh, shouldn't have jinxed it. Shouldn't have jinxed it. That's okay. I really didn't mind. Over all these things, all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. I mean, the attitude of thankfulness the attitude of contentment comes out of peace or can even create peace in your own heart. I'd like to live in a world like that. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm the invading force. You know, I'll, I'll be in line at Walmart and, you know, someone in front of me is being all cranky to the cashier and I'll be like, don't you pay attention to them, darling. You know, don't you pay attention to them. They're just having a bad day. This is, this is not who you are. You are much more than this. And, you know, I'm bringing the kingdom of light. I'm bringing peace into situations. Or sometimes I'll just tell a person, do you mind not, like, taking out all your anger on this poor worker? <laughs> Depends what kind of mood I'm in. <laughs> but sometimes I'm invading as the, as, the, as the people of light, the people of peace, the people of hope, the people of compassion, the people of gentleness. I am the kingdom of God present in that moment. On a bad day, I could be the kingdom of darkness in that moment, right? But we make a choice of how we're going to respond, not always how we feel. And so we are called out of the kingdom of darkness. Even though we were, because of Adam and Eve, because of the sin, because we inherited, we've inherited the kingdom of darkness, and God has called us out of it. And he's called us into a brand new kind of living, a brand new kind of life. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, you are a chosen person. I want you to look at the person next to you and say, you're chosen. Yeah, 
Oh, poor Stephen, right? There's no one on either side. Oh, <laughs> Brad, tell him he's chosen. That's good. You are chosen. You know, I often think about, you know, how does God choose? I, I think it's like if he came into a dark cave and there was lots of people in there and he held up light and he said, I choose you. <laughs> Who responds? Whoever responds is welcome to the light. I've chosen you to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's, think of this, this is how he sees you. You're his special possession. You're his special possession. You're like a chocolate chip cookie at the Morse, house, Morse household. Except he won't eat you. <laughs> a precious possession. And what for? That you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Declaring, you are the kingdom of God present. You are the kingdom that's in the midst of of the people around you. You are the kingdom of light. It's amazing. You know, it's redemption. But redemption, it's a little bit messy by times, right? It's a little bit messy. Do you know, God had originally set up humans as the authority on this planet. He did. That was our role. We were to be stewards of the Garden of Eden. We were to be stewards of, of great things. If I think about it, you know, the world was created, and then the garden was created. And if you think about how, how Israel worked into their inheritance, they were to tend the garden, they were to grow the garden. And I, in my own mind's eye, this is, I don't know if anybody else thinks this, but I think to myself, what was God's intention but for that garden to grow and cover the whole earth? To bring the peace, to create, to enjoy creation. But it's like Satan was like a big bully. Has anyone ever heard a bully steal your bike? I've had a bully try and steal my bike. And I've had someone steal my bike. Not at the same time. But I've discovered that there's some bullies that there's just no talking your way out of. I was able to talk my way out of him taking my bike because I wouldn't get off it. <laughs> But this bully, Satan, has set up his own kingdom. And he's not only set up his own kingdom, he's unrepentant, he's boastful, he's proud of what he's done, and he's gloating over you and over this world what he has done to our shame at our cost. And you're not going to get your bike back from that kind of bully unless you can take it. You know, but Satan had gone from sneaky serpent to full-on dragon. Full-on dragon. And the dragon was too much for us in our broken state. So if someone had stolen my bike and they were bigger than me, do you know what I would do? I would go get my big brother. <laughs> and if he wouldn't get it back by himself, he had lots of friends. <laughs> and if he wasn't enough, I would have got my dad. And this is exactly what's happened. Jesus in scripture is sometimes referred to as our elder brother. And we have God the Father. And this bully Satan is too big for us. But this is what God says. I love this scripture. This is from Isaiah 49. Can plunder be taken from warriors? Warriors who have taken it from someone else? I took my bike? Can plunder be taken from warriors? Or captives rescued from the fierce. And Satan is fierce. He's not happy. That's too bad. Because our God is fighting for us. Do you have a family member who is held captive by the enemy? Sure you do. We all do. Can they be rescued from the fierce? It seems impossible and sometimes it's impossible for us. It's not within our strength to rescue these captives. And it's frustrating. Because <laughs> sometimes, I was sharing with somebody this week, sometimes when we do everything in our power, we actually make things worse. <laughs> but this is what the Lord says. Yes, captives can be taken. Oh, actually, it doesn't say can be taken. Listen to this. Captives will be taken 
from warriors, and plunder will be retrieved from the fierce. Why? He says this, I, I will contend with those who contend with you. Oh yeah. And your children, I will save. That's what we're praying for. Who is fighting for you? It's it's not even your pastor. It's your God. The one who does the impossible. And this scripture is just alive this morning. I will contend for your children. I will retrieve from the fierce the things that were stolen from you. I will set the captives free. That's you, that's your family, that's your health, that's your finances, that's all these things. The Lord is going to contend for you against those who have contended against you. It's a rich gift that we need to celebrate. Second Corinthians says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is anyone in Christ this morning? I'm in Christ this morning. You're a new creature. You are a new creature. You are part of the kingdom of light. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us This is what he has entrusted to us. God has contended for you. He's rescued you. You're part of the kingdom of light. He's gotten your bike back and he's shown you how to do that and how to help others. He's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for the kingdom of light, whether you're in line at Walmart, whether your bike's trying to be stolen, whether you're interceding for your children, whatever it is, you are an ambassador for Christ. As though God himself were making an appeal through us. And we beg. And we beg on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Lord, grant us the strength and the mercy and the confidence and the courage and the infilling of your Holy Spirit to be the ambassadors of the kingdom of light. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, but I also want to ask Esther, do you mind if we have a little time of prayer for you? I'd like to ask the deacons um, and anyone from the missions team or has a heart for missions uh, to maybe come and and lay hands as well. Um, I just want to pray for Esther. It's a new journey. It's a new day. It's it's exciting. And we just want to... um, bless you, Esther. You've been a blessing to us. You've been a blessing to the nations. You've been a blessing to St. John. And we just want to um, lay our hands on you and commission you for this next phase, this next season. Uh, You are a mighty woman of God and you just need to be released and empowered. And we're just going to do that right now. Heavenly Father, Esther is your woman. You've created her for such a time as this. And Lord, it's a changing season, and we pray that you'd lead her by your Holy Spirit, that you would guide her by your hand, that you would lead her to her next mission field. Lord, we thank you for the time she's going to be able to spend with her family. But Lord, we ask for your grace and your special anointing to be upon her. Lord, as she travels back to Africa, as she travels across Canada, as she travels different places, Lord, let your spirit fly through her. Lord, she is an ambassador for the kingdom of light, and we commission her, Lord, just as Paul and Barnabas and others were commissioned. Lord, we commission her as your ambassador of light, and Lord, let your light shine through her beyond her own expectations. I pray that you would amaze Esther by your goodness, 
by your faithfulness, by the way you take care of her, by the way you watch after her, by the way you protect her, by the way you speak through her, by the way you inspire her, Lord, by the lives that are touched through her life. And Lord, we pray that there would be a rich harvest of souls as people see your kingdom of light in her. Lord, allow people to see your beauty in her and be attracted to you, Lord Jesus. We pray for your uh, favor to go in front of her, that, Lord, your angels would go in front of her, beside her, behind her, that, Lord, you'd scatter the enemy in seven different directions, that no weapon formed against her, Lord, would, would prosper because, Lord, you are sending your mighty warrior, Lord, your lioness. Lord, send her out, roaring your praises and encouraging the body, and, Lord, sending light into dark places where there is no hope that people might know you and give their lives to you and surrender to you and be brought out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for your special anointing to just be with her, that you'd bring her recreation in her heart, that, Lord, you bring peace in her mind, that you'd make her direction clear, that you'd make her way straight, that, Lord, you'd um, make the path straight for her. Mighty God, we thank you for this calling you put on Esther to, to reach the nations, to be a missionary, to be an ambassador, to be a minister in your name. So Lord, fill her with your spirit. Watch over her and guide her. And we thank you for her willingness and her yes and her amen to you. So God, thank you that you've equipped her and you continue to equip her with everything she needs to roar out the goodness the wonderful kingdom of God. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. Uh, amen. Esther, we appreciate you and your ministry so much. Thank you very much for your support. I know this church supports my project very, very much. And I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord bless you. Pastor, thank you.